In 2011, an ordinary guy named Chris Camillo made the news. Sometimes it's not what you invest in, it's what you don't invest in, and I only make one or two big trades a year. And it helped one man make millions. Chris Camillo, author of Laughing at Wall Street, joins us via Skype. The top-ranked self-directed investor in the world. Through stock trading, he turned $20,000 into $2 million. I did so by turning $20,000 into over $2 million in my personal investing account. You turned $20,000 into $2 million during the financial crisis. And he which did is this in the space of three years and during a global recession. Reporters praised him for earning so much money despite the disadvantage of being an ordinary investor and not working on Wall Street. Chris claims that being an ordinary investor was not a disadvantage, but an advantage, and part of how he beat Wall Street at their own game. And what's really amazing is that he's also helping people do the same. In fact, we've seen similar success in our own teaching portfolio up over 50% already this year. If you're interested in learning those strategies, I'm hosting a three-day masterclass next week. Each day at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I'll spend an hour showing you exactly our trade rules, how we set it up and everything else. Just head over to phoenixfriends.org slash masterclass and get yourself a free ticket. To understand Chris's mindset, you need to know that he's been obsessed with investing and making money for as far as he can remember. When he was just 12 years old, he wanted to invest in stocks and had a light bulb moment. This was the beginning of his path towards becoming a millionaire. It was the early winter and he asked his father if he could invest his pocket money in the toy store Toys R Us. He figured that Christmas is coming, people are going to buy a lot of toys and the stock is going to go up. While this thinking made sense, his father explained that there was one massive hole in his theory. Everyone else knew that Christmas was coming up and everybody else knew that Toys R Us are soon going to sell a lot of toys. In fact, Toys R Us's share price had already factored in that, we're, that they were going to sell a lot of toys over the Christmas period. Chris later found out there is a term for this known as efficient markets theory. Basically, all stock prices will reflect all of the available information. He realized from this moment onwards that winning in the stock market involves discovering information that everyone else doesn't necessarily know. Chris looked into two famous trading strategies used by Wall Street. The first one was technical analysis, where you look at what has happened in the past and try to predict what will happen in the future. The problem with this is that the stock market rarely works that way. Warren Buffett famously said, if past history was all there is to the game, the richest people in the world would be librarians. Chris then turned to fundamental analysis. This is when you spend lots of time digging and digging like Winston likes to through a company's financial accounts, he prefers the beach, and come up with the true value of a company. If this true value is higher than the actual share price, then the share price is undervalued and should go up. And if the true value is lower, then the share price is overvalued and should inevitably go down. Chris saw a lot of value in fundamental analysis, but then thought about the competition. All across Wall Street, there were Harvard-educated intellectuals hired to do this analysis as their full-time job. So it's unlikely that he could spot something that they couldn't. For retail traders, this is like an ordinary runner thinking they can go up against a race full of Olympic athletes. The competition in this space is almost too big. Then came Chris's second light bulb moment. The fact that he's not a wealthy Wall Street banker put him at an immediate disadvantage in the investment world. But what if he turned this into an advantage? What if there were advantages of being an ordinary guy? And this basically gave birth to his genius trading plan. Chris's investment strategy did not come from an investment book or through speaking to a Wall Street trader. In fact, his life changed when he was merely buying a bottle of Snapple at a 7-Eleven. Chris regularly bought this drink, and whenever he went into his local 7-Eleven, there were usually two refrigerators stacked full of Snapple. However, one day, he noticed that the Snapple bottles were now only in one of the refrigerators and only taking up half the space. His 7-Eleven had cut back on Snapple by 75%, and chances are they were doing this all across the country. 
Unlike his earlier theory that Toys R Us was going to sell more toys at Christmas, this was information that not everybody knew about. And importantly, Wall Street did not know about it either. What Chris had come across was not just information, but game-changing information. This was information that had the power to change the share price of a publicly listed stock. And this is the biggest lesson from Chris. Ordinary people have valuable information. They just need to use it. The fact is that we witness valuable investment knowledge all the time, whether we realize it or not. Chris's older brother was a securities broker, and he asked him if he could make money from this information. His brother told him that he could go short on the stock, as this could bring their market price down. So he invested in this and tripled his $300 investment. He didn't become a millionaire of this trade, but it sowed the seeds of what his investment strategy would look like. In fact, merely finding out that there is less Snapple in the supermarket is not enough to base an investment strategy on. He needed to fine tune this process and go through a series of checks and balances to make sure it was robust enough to risk his money. This is where his trading went from a basic theory to a fully fleshed out strategy. While ordinary people might make similar observations, I think the next steps are what made Chris a millionaire and shows that he was fully committed to making his strategy work. To explain his strategy, Chris often gives this example of what he witnessed at a Wendy's in 2013. The restaurant had recently introduced a pretzel bacon cheeseburger, and it was incredibly popular. So to test his observation, he asked the manager about the product and then went around to various other Wendy stores and asked other managers. All of them were saying the same thing. We've never seen anything like this before. He also asked random customers and came with a similar overwhelming sense of approval. This helped test his theory and make it more robust. He had other people who agreed with him and decided to invest. But before he did so, he needed to do one last thing. Before making an investment, Chris double checks that Wall Street does not know about his observation. To do this, Chris will check whether his observation is not yet reflected in the company's public financial records and whether this observation is not yet in Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, or other media outlets. Chris describes his conversations with customers and managers as social data, whereas Wall Street merely looks at transactional data or the company's sales. So Chris was looking at companies through a completely different lens. And this is also how ordinary people can beat Wall Street too. In an interview, Chris said, Wall Street's core demographic tends to be middle-aged, affluent males who work and reside in major metropolitan areas. So they tend to be biased and tend to be slower to pick up on trends that involve female, youth, low-income, and rural trends. We have access to a more diversified set of friends and colleagues throughout the country that know more things than those on Wall Street. Wall Street traders were not eating at a Wendy's nor were they speaking to managers and customers about their product. Chris discovered Wall Street's blind spot and found ways that he could compete in the investment world. Reflecting on his Wendy's investment, Chris said, when it turned out that this was the best performing menu item in 20 years, Wall Street finally paid attention and Wendy's stock doubled. Once Wall Street found out about it and the stock went up, Chris cashed in his winnings and exited the trade. His exit strategy became when the social data and the transactional data matched together. So time and time again, Chris regularly won against Wall Street. In fact, whenever Chris finds himself doubting himself, he remembers a time when all of the experts on Wall Street got something completely wrong. In fact, there is one obvious mistake that Wall Street made, which they probably don't want you to know about. You might find this hard to believe, but Wall Street didn't think much of the first ever iPhone. So while Chris was incredibly excited about this product in 2007, he noticed that the financial world was saying the exact opposite. And just like when he was in the supermarket buying a bottle of Snapple, his investment brain once again clicked into action. In 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled the first ever iPhone. This is not a watered down version of the internet. It was set to revolutionize technology in everyday life, but Wall Street did not buy into the hype. 
In fact, I found this article on MarketWatch from 2007 that said another phone in a crowded market. There is also footage of the then CEO of Microsoft laughing at the iPhone because it does not have a keyboard. And the reality is that today, nobody's phone has a keypad. But for the regular consumer in 2007, the iPhone was something exciting and brand new. It was taking the mobile phone to breathtaking new levels and putting almost everything you could need inside a device that could fit into your pocket. And this was how Chris and his friends felt about the new iPhone. Chris wrote in his book, nearly every one of our friends and neighbors expressed one of the following three sentiments. I intend to buy an iPhone tomorrow. I intend to buy an iPhone once my existing mobile phone contract expires. Or I intend to buy an iPhone once the price drops to some predetermined dollar amount I have in my head. The iPhone was released and contrary to what Wall Street believed, became an instant bestseller. By 2008, Apple had sold 13.7 million iPhones, and this had exceeded their initial target of selling 10 million. So even when Wall Street is fully aware of a company and their new products, they still don't always get things right. However, by now you might be wondering why Wall Street and the investment world have not caught up with Chris's investment strategy. Surely, if they wanted to make more money, it'd be foolish to ignore Chris's success. Well, the fact is that Wall Street is keenly aware and fascinated by his investment strategy. But whether they can fully replicate it is difficult to tell. In 2015, Chris started his own company called TickerTax, which monitors social media to find social data for investing. The company had built-in tax that monitors data for 8,000 stocks. So this gathered social data, but on social media sites. Through analyzing social media, the platform correctly predicted the outcome of the 2016 Brexit referendum, which none of the mainstream media saw coming. And when Netflix launched the show Stranger Things, Wall Street investors focused on the viewership figures, but ticker tags focused on how many people were talking about it on social media. The people on Wall Street knew that Stranger Things was a hit show based on the viewing figures, as it was relatively similar to other hit shows. But Chris noticed that the conversations about Stranger Things were much higher than any other hit show. So through this different set of data, he was able to project that this is a long-term hit show and would benefit the long-term price of Netflix. A long-term hit means that people are still excited about the second, third, and fourth season. With all that being said, I'm hesitant to say that this was the sole reason for Netflix rallying, but it was definitely an important factor. In 2018, Chris sold ticker tax, and the company is now owned by Jeffrey's Financial Group. Since then, many hedge funds have used ticker tax as their pool of information. So you could argue that this is now part of Wall Street. However, there are some aspects of Chris's strategy that Wall Street simply can't replicate. Chris has often compared his strategy to being a big wave surfer. Surfers want to ride big waves, have to be patient and wait for strange weather patterns to arrive. And this is not something that can be forced. This could take months and months to arrive. And if he hasn't made any solid observations, he just doesn't trade. Wall Street, as you can imagine, can't do this. Professional investors need to invest to justify their salaries. But retail traders don't need to do this. And they can invest as and when they wish. Today, Chris is a thought leader on the strategy and the head of a trading community known as Dumb Money, who have a fantastic YouTube channel which you should check out. And the term dumb money is a term famously used by Wall Street insiders to refer to retail traders. So he's poking fun at Wall Street here. I would highly recommend his book. It's called Laughing at Wall Street if you want a deeper dive into a story and a fascinating way of investing. Um, this was actually a very exciting rabbit hole for me to go down. So I want to know your thoughts about this investment strategy and whether you think it could work. Speaking of investing strategies, don't forget about our upcoming three-day masterclass. It's just an hour each evening at 8 p.m. Eastern time where I'll walk you through setting up trades, timing them, automating your profit-taking and your risk management so you walk away with a rule book. 
and you can secure your spot at felixfriends.org slash masterclass for free. Thank you for watching and make sure you hit the subscribe button.